The early show will begin after a brief word from today's sponsor, Answering Legal. Visit AnsweringLegal.com to learn more about our 24-7 virtual receptionist team. Answering Legal has been pivotal to allow our virtual law firm to thrive. Without them, we would not be able to handle the call volume that comes to our law firm. We needed a service that would allow us to be able to take those messages, yet still focus on working with our clients and be able to call them back. Answering Legal has been phenomenal on getting a great customer service relationship with people that are calling into the firm, taking messages, giving us those messages, and we can get back to them very shortly. All right, welcome back to The Early Show, sponsored by your friends over at Answering Legal. Today, we have a real treat. We have Ken Hardison from Pilma. Um, I'm truly pumped up to talk with Ken today. He is someone who has mentored me. He's helped me grow considerably in my career. He's not only super smart, he's a really good dude. We could all learn a ton from Ken. He's a personal friend of mine, so I'm really excited to talk with Ken today. As always, uh, I encourage you to sharpen your pencils. There'll be plenty of writer downers, I'm sure. So make sure you take lots of notes, right? We're going to be chopping up quite a bit today. Uh, so, Ken, thank you so much for coming on the early show. I really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me, my friend. It's, it's an honor. Oh, uh, thank you. It means a lot. So, I want to have you on the show because I know that you and I we have a few things in common. And that's the that's the the person I like to bring on the show. Not random people, but people I actually have a, a, a connection with. And so, you and I have quite a few things in common, as far as I can see. First thing is we're both really, really hard workers. We're just like. We put our head down, we work, we get stuff done, right? Um, and we both had unique struggles growing up that we that we had to deal with and persevere and, and get through. We are both passionate lawyer entrepreneurs, and we are as well fans of direct response marketing. That's an important point as well. And additionally, we're both, I think, on that topic of direct response marketing, have been influenced by Dan Kennedy. And finally, I see both of us as just forever learners, right? We get into this stuff. We we get into marketing and, and law firm management, and we just I I know we both have a passion for that. And to me, I look at you as a guy with a lot of grit, and and I think grit is what all successful people need to have. Right? We go through so many battles in life. You actually sent me as a Pilma member. You sent me a sign. It's the it's the word grit, and the definition of grit is right under that. It's it's actually my office, and I love that sign. So grit is something that you have a ton of. I have a ton of. And so I'm just really excited to, to talk with you. I know you. I know your story. For those who don't know Ken Hardison, could you just tell us about your upbringing, you know, mom and dad, what was it like growing up? Just take us back to when you were young. What do you what do you remember about that? Yeah, sure. And, yeah, we do have a lot in common. The only thing is I'm like twice your age. <laughs> I'm twice you your age. a lot of energy, though. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I got a wife that feeds me and stays on me to do things like walk and work out with a trainer and stuff like that. Yeah. Man. Yeah. So I grew up very humbly. I, I, I wouldn't say that I ever missed a meal. Uh, and you can still tell that I never miss a meal, but, uh, my, I grew up, uh, in a little town, actually out in the country, uh, on I-95, the, the nearest city we had about 10,000 people in it. Dad had a fourth grade education. Mother had an eighth grade education. She worked in a factory sewing. My dad worked with a lumber company. Um, so very young on, I started working, and I think we had about eight acre, acres that my dad would raise tobacco on in the summer to try to help make, make ends meet. And so I would help on the farm on that part, and we had a garden. We, we, we would grow a lot of our own vegetables and stuff and canned and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Had a few pigs, did a little slaughter every, every you know, Christmas time when it gets cold. So you can do it outside because we didn't have freezers. And uh, Wow. Yeah, so we grew up like that. So I worked in tobacco till probably I was in eighth grade. And then they started using herbicides that would make me this sick as a dog. And I got a job at a grocery store in eighth grade. And I worked there, I went up to become a butcher. So I worked there. And then like my junior, between my junior and senior year, my dad got a job offer in another city and he wanted to move. And uh, I didn't want to go. And I'd already, I was working that you know, I was working pretty much just about a full-time job and going to high school. I worked because the grocery store stayed open nine, ten o'clock at night. 
I get out of school and go work, work Saturdays, Sundays. And, uh, I was, I was team captain of the football team. I had a girlfriend, you know, I didn't want to move. And my dad says, well, you don't have to move, but you're on your own. And I said, okay. So I rented an apartment, $15 a week across the street from the high school. And, uh, you know, went to college, to a local college, uh, worked my way through that, did, did the butchering and uh, did some, delivered some papers, worked in the, law, the law, library, work study at night. And uh, got married between my freshman and sophomore year in, in college. Lucky enough to get in law school at Campbell University, uh, which no pe- not many people know about, but it's we always beat Duke and Carolina Wake Forest on the bar exam. They teach nothing but North Carolina law. They teach a lot of trial ed. So it's a good school to go to if you want to practice in North Carolina, and that's what I wanted to do. And I was fortunate enough to get a uh, scholarship to go to law school. Uh, they just they, they paid their tuition. I had to buy my books and my room and board, but uh, that was nice. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was still working some, some, not as much when I was in law school, but some. And uh, had our first kid my first year law school right before the December exams. In fact, uh, as we record this, the day is he, he turns 44 today. Oh, my God. Uh, Amazing. Yeah, Brad, Brad Hardison. Yes, yeah, so it was kind of wild. And uh, so I was clerking with different law firms. And, uh, you know, like I said, we uh, we grew up kind of poor. But, I mean, we had a roof over our head. I mean, we had like a single wide trailer, no underpinning, you know, it was, uh, but you know, we got, we got, we got three square meals a day and, uh, I bought my own school clothes and did all things like that. They just couldn't afford it, you know, but anyway, got out of law school, went and worked with this firm down at the beach area of North Carolina, worked there about three months. We worked six and a half days a week. We worked wow. Monday through Saturday and then Sunday afternoon. How many hours a week? It was over 80. Wow. It was over over 80. So Carolina was playing Clemson. This is probably 1982. And both of them were ranked in like the top 10 in the nation. It's back when Lawrence Taylor was playing with the the Clemson. And Carolina had a bunch of really good people. LT. And I I had somebody, one of my law school mates said, I got a couple free tickets. You and your wife come on up and let's walk good with game. So I went in like Monday before the. Saturday ball game. I said, uh, uh, I want to take off Saturday. And he said, I just don't see how you can do it. I said, we don't have any trials Monday. He said, I just don't see it. He said, we got so much to do. You know, so I walked back to my office and I sat there and I thought about it. Yeah. And I walked back in. I said, I quit. I said, and I'm not doing what I was going to do with a kid. Wife moved up there. She didn't have a job. I only been there two or three months. And, uh, I said, I can work, I can walk out right now or I can work until you can find somebody to replace me. I said, but I am going to the ball game, by the way, uh, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and since then I've never worked for anybody else. And I just, I don't think I do good at it, you know, uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. you know, and I went back to my hometown, opened up an office, uh, really just went around to every lawyer in town, in the county and said, you got any cases that you don't want, mm-hmm. I'll take them. You got any research, I'll do it. Anything you throw my any bones you can throw my way, I, I appreciate it. And they they were they give me a lot of work. And uh, then you know I uh, I would go around to the country stores and sit around and drink Coca Colas with, with peanuts and and just get to know you know just let everybody know I'm back in town because I hadn't been gone you know going off to school I'd been gone. And uh, you know got back into church and got back into clubs and. Uh, I did okay. I didn't make a lot of money in the first year, to be honest with you. I mean, I think Nobody I grossed, does. To gross yeah. thirty six thousand dollars. <laughs> Better than I did. Better than me. Yeah, and uh, but I was working. This, was, this is in the eighties. This is in the mid eighties, right? This is in the eighties. Yeah, 80s. yeah. yeah. That's, not, that's was, not such a bad first year, man. No, probably not. Because I mean, starting salaries were like twenty eight thousand, mm. uh, even for people, you know, for around, unless you were a Wall Street lawyer. Most, mm-hmm. A lot of my schoolmates started for twenty five, twenty eight thousand. The really good ones. So I, mean, I did all right. Of course, I had some overhead, of course. But uh, yeah. there's this law firm across the street that had been there since nineteen thirty two. It was like three generations, like grandfather, father, and son. And of course, the, the grand the grandfather had died, and the and the father was getting really old, and he didn't want to go to court anymore. 
So they started associating me to go to do trials for him because his son was more of a real estate and state lawyer. He really didn't like do. He didn't really like trials. And to be honest mm-hmm. with you, really won't get at it. Mm-hmm. And after about a year of that, they made me partner. Mm-hmm. Well, made me a third partner, and uh, without, without me having to buy him, which was really nice of them. And uh, I built a really big PI practice over there. And then I did DWIs, criminal, and 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 PI, and a little bit of workers cop, social security, and uh, you know when I mean, we hired another lawyer, he did domestic, and then my partner, he was doing real estate and state work, wills and trusts, stuff like that. So we grew. I grew the business like I like five times the business over like ten years of what they were doing when I joined. And, uh, and, and I, I, I guess you could say I'm bragging, and I guess I am, but in the South, if, if it's the facts, it's the facts. It ain't mm-hmm. bragging. But they, the, my two partners at that time, because the father had died by then, they were, they were actually bringing home more salary than they were bringing in gross. Mm. Uh, so that wasn't good, right? Uh, mm. But I was okay with it because, you know, it, we, we, we gave us a full service law firm. That was my thinking at the time. But I saw mm-hmm. our practice in 93 and 94 starting to kind of just plateau. And I go to court one day. This is like 95. And I got to see a WI client. And uh, he walks in the courtroom with crutches. And I said, Joe, what happened? He said, I got hit by a semi. I said, well, you know, I do that. He said, yeah, but I hired this guy off TV. I figured he must be able to be good if he's on TV. And I said, Damn. So I go and try his case. I went to DWI and uh, go back to the office and I sat down and I said, I, said, part, I told my partner, I said, we've got to change. We've got to start marketing. And they said, no, we're, it's unprofessional. We're not going to do it. And so we had a dialogue for about six months and finally I just left and I took uh, two staff and uh, three staff and another associate lawyer and went out and then when I, I borrowed everything I could borrow off of all the and money I had saved. I took all my savings. I took everything I had leveraged it and went on TV and uh, five years later we had 13 lawyers and 47 staff uh, and we were doing like from five, half a million to eight million like like five six years now I've been six I won't say five but it was like at least yeah about five or six and uh, you know kept that going and rolling along and uh then I don't know. I woke up one morning in about 2007 and I said, you know, I'm not looking forward to going to work anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, got to thinking about it. And I said, you know, I proved it, but, you know, I want to do something else or maybe I want to retire. So I, uh, I worked out a deal with my partner then, Ben Cochran. And uh, I went three years like I worked four days. Then I went the next year, I worked three days. The next year, I worked two days. And then I turned it over to him. And uh, they'll finance the whole deal for him because I trusted him. And uh, I moved down to the beach, was going to play golf and fish and just enjoy life at 52. And uh, got very bored very quickly. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, lawyers were calling me all the time and emailing me because I was still off counsel at the old law firm. So people could still get up with me. And uh, just picking my brain all the time. And then my wife said, "You, you need to start charging for this, Kim. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I said, well, you're probably right. She says, you know, she's, so we did. And we started Pilma in 2009. Uh, that was kind of like before then because I sold it from in 2010, but it was kind of like a hobby. I was doing a mastermind. That's had one mastermind. It was like six or seven lawyers. But anyway, we just played around with it kind of like a hobby, but it gave me something to do, something to get up, look forward to, uh, uh who don't like the, you know, show off their, their knowledge, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. just ego. But, you know, it just really, it took off. And then two or three years later, it got to a million dollars. I said, this could be a real business. Mm-hmm. And so I really got serious about it then. And just, and I, and I got, I got, you know, as you do things, you get better at it, right? And I, got, I got better at it. I think I did anyway. Uh, you have to be the judge of that. I don't know. You, you've been with me. But I think no. I get better. I think I learned. I mean, you know, the big deal about me is I know you never know it all. So I'm welcome to learn new things. I mean, like, the stuff that we have now that I didn't have, we had the internet, but it, we had just started good. I mean, we started yep. doing a uh, website in 2003. 
so that was 20 years ago, but there was no social media. Uh, there was no Spotify. There was no uh, uh, LinkedIn. You know, you know, it was, it was all just TV billboards and Yellow Pages. And that's changed because Yellow Pages is gone. You know, and I was one of the first people to pull out of Yellow Pages. I was spending, in 2005, I spent $630,000 on Yellow Pages in North Carolina. In 2006, I spent 35000 <laughs> I cut wow. it 600,000 wow. and I drove all, I had all the big wheels coming down talking to me. What the hell are you doing? I said, this, I said, I'll be keeping my numbers and this is why you want to know your numbers. Right. Mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I'm getting calls. They said, well, you're getting calls. I said, yeah, but look, here's the deal. Eight years ago, I was getting cases for $300. Now it's costing me $2,700. Mm-hmm. I said, and my average fee is only like $8,000. Mm-hmm. I said, I got to have a five or six return. So I ain't saying I ain't get it, but it's just not pre- Whereas with TV, I was getting them for about five, six hundred dollars, right? Yeah. So I said, you know, and then the internet, I was getting them for like even three hundred dollars. So I took all my money and put them divided TV and and uh, the uh, internet because if I hadn't known my number, that's why you know I really preach this. You got to know your numbers. I mean, and it's harder now because things come from everywhere. Mm. But the online, you can tell to a certain degree. Depends on the bigger you are, the harder it is to. To, to do uh, to have a, a trip, you know what I'm talking att- attribution. Sure. The smaller you are, the easier it is uh, because mm-hmm. you ain't doing so many things, right? Yeah. But uh, but here's a little tip: when everybody calls you, don't just ask them how they heard about you. Ask them what they were looking at when they dialed the number. Okay, because mm-hmm. that can make. And then also ask them, like, if you do TV and they say, "I got, I got," I'm looking at the internet. Say, have you ever heard? Have you ever seen our TV commercial? Have you ever heard our radio commercials? Just do a little more, a little bit more, just that extra 15 seconds. And listen, it's still not a science. And you're still not going to be 100%, but it, having something better than having nothing. Uh, 100%. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. uh, but it is harder. It, I mean, it was it was so much easier when I was practicing back in the 90s and early 2000s because you really could kind of track. We use tracking numbers and they want this people going, going on TV and then going to the internet and calling you off the internet number and it's just a lot different. Yeah, no, no question. Well, I, I love the story, man. I got to go back in time a little bit. Let me ask you this. Did you ever have a paper route by chance? Yeah. Yeah. I had, I delivered. I knew every, it. Like, a junior and senior in high school and the freshman year in college, I was delivering 300 papers every morning. Uh, and I had a Volkswagen and I'd get up at three o'clock and having to done by it took me six because I had like sixty mile route. It won't it won't a city route. It was a country route. Wow. That's hardcore, man. That's a yeah, that's it was hard. hardcore. Yeah, and I would sit there and rub them up. You know, I go to the post office. They, they, they I remember they drop them off about three o'clock, and uh, I'd go up there and throw them in the back, and I would have my rubber bands there, and I'd sit there and drive with my with my uh, legs and sit there and rubber band them and throw them out. Yeah, whip them out. Yeah, and then when it was raining, I had to put them in plastic bags and just. Yeah. But yeah, I did that for several years. I finally just got burned out on it, and um, <laughs> and I was I was just tearing my car all to pieces. I mean, I had to I put like I put three new rebuilt motors in that Volkswagen in about four years. <laughs> it's a big paper. I'm telling you, everyone, so many successful people who I talk to, I ask, "Hey, have you, did you have a paper?" Yes. It's the funniest thing, man. It's yeah. just so, just a universal truth. I don't know. Do we still even have paper roots? Are they? I don't even think they're a thing anymore. Uh, no, I still get. Well, I get. I actually get the uh, Wall Street Journal every morning. Okay. I cut my um, local paper, but I do get it now. My wife, she don't. Even, she pulls everything off of. Uh, she gets all digital. She does the New York Times. Yeah. She reads the Wall, yeah. She reads Wall Street Journal on her phone. Yeah. I, I, I'm old school. I just prefer to smell the ink and. Touch it. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know if there's actually paper boys and paper girls running around anymore, but it's it's different. But I got to ask you a question which kind of stuck at me. So when your dad and you kind of, you decided to stay and he decided to leave, how did that feel for you though? I mean, um, did it feel like he was leaving you or was it? No, I mean, you- I, I mean, they left, but I mean, I, I could have went with them. I mean, it's yeah. Big, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I felt a little guilty because I felt like I might be abandoning my family, but yeah, I would do, I was going to be leaving the next year anyway. And, and I really, I mean, I had a good gig there with the football team. I know if I went up to Sanford, that's where they were moving, I'd have to prove myself. I, I didn't yeah. get to play. 
which is kind of funny because Sanford won the state championship the next year. Wow, <laughs> but, no kidding, but it was huh? a different, but it was a different division, you know, a different class. Uh, they yeah. were like division four. We were like division three or whatever they call it, you know, three A versus four A. It was a bigger school, but uh, yeah, a little bit, but not too bad. And listen, I go up and see them. I mean, you know, being dad, we, you know, I mean, it wasn't like I just walked away and didn't, never have any conversation with anybody. Sure, I mean, you sure. know, yeah. I mean, you know, I'd go up and I don't know. And my grandmother lived in town, and I could go over there and wash my clothes. You know, she lived out in the country, and that, that, they kind of that helped too because I could kind of look out look out for her to make sure she was all right. She lived by herself. Let me ask you this: How did they? I mean, you know, modest beginnings, right? You know, just to be blunt. I mean, what did your parents think about you going to law school? Were the heads just spinning, like at that success? I mean, how did they? Take yeah, it? it's funny. It's funny, you know, the deal was. My dad was never a, a guy to really like give a lot of affirmation. Um, I don't mean he didn't love me, but he just was not a guy to. Now, after he died, I had people come up and tell me, he said, your dad was so proud of you. You just don't know how much he bragged on you. So, but he would not brag to me. You know what I'm saying? He didn't want me to get a big head, I think. Mm -hmm. So he yeah. never would, you know, uh, and, and uh, he died very early. He died when he was 62. Uh, I was probably in my thirties, like mid thirties, mm -hmm. uh, when he died. Um, so yeah, but, uh, yeah, he was tough. I mean, he won't mean, but he was just tough. You know what I'm saying? He just was, the, my mother was the, the, the feel good, love you, hug you, tell you how much she loves you every day. She was all that. And of course she lived a lot longer. She lived like 22 years after he died. She just died a couple of years ago. She was 88. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Sorry. Well, no, she lived a good life, you know? Yeah. Yeah. She was, yeah. she was ready. I'll be honest. She was ready. She had Still, made her peace with the world. She was ready to go. Well, that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's, that's all we can ask for, for our parents. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And ourselves. So you, um, I just, I just hear in your story, it's just, uh, you know, thinking for, you know, not being, uh, always looking ahead at the next, the next opportunity, seeing the, you know, seeing this, you know, one firm is just, you know, working to death. I want to go to the football game, you know, and that's, that's the life I want, but that's hard as hell. Like that was a scary moment. Looking back, it's like, oh, I did that. But at the moment, like that's scary as hell. Um, yeah. sp spending all that money on TV, looking back, it all worked out, but that was scary as hell. So, you know, I would encourage the listener, you know, successful people, they, they get through adversity, but they keep on going. Right. Yeah. I mean, can myself, I, there's just, there's so many people out there that just keep on moving forward and you have to. And I just, you know, I look at you and me, there's a lot of grit there. Just grit. You either, you can't like teach grit. You can't put that on somebody. Right. And I, and I yeah. hear grit and I, and I, and I, and I, and I uh, share that feeling. Right. Cause like, and I've been open. I'm not the best freaking lawyer. I'm not the best trial lawyer, but I'll me work. Either. I'll outwork you though. You know, that's so I lean into that. I know you relate to that. Like we'll yeah. outwork the pack and it's nothing special about us. We're just like, that's just what we lean into. And we we're good at that stuff. You know, you know it's, it's kind of, that was kind of the way I was raised. You know, you just outwork your opponent, you know, outwork, oh. you know, you get ahead. Now I have changed. I still work hard, but I have tried to learn to work smarter. And what you I mean by to. that is you have to uh, used to, and this is probably a real big revelation to me is to leverage my strengths and just, delegate my weaknesses and get hire people smarter than me and, and empower them and entrust them and you know, hold them accountable. But, but, uh, see, I can teach management all day long, but I'm a terrible manager. Now I'm, I'm, I'm a, I think I'm a great marketer. I think I'm a great ideal guy. I'm a good visionary guy and I'm not a detail person when it comes down to getting in the weeds. I can give you the big idea and kind of give you the outline. But when it gets down to the little nitty gritty, I got to have somebody else to do that because I'll get too bored. I, I can't got the attention span to do it. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah. But I think that's that was a big deal. And you're right, though. I, I, somebody was on another, somebody else's podcast said, "What do you think? Like the two or three things you know that, that are the keys to success?" And I said, "Grit and focus, <laughs> especially grit, because you cannot." You, if somebody says no, or you run over this obstacle, you just figure out, go around it, above it, underneath it, you know, however, you just figure out how you don't take no for an answer. 
and you just keep charging forward. And then focus is, and this, I've always had to agree, I've had to work on the focus because entrepreneurs, we're, we're terrible about getting the next shiny object. We, we get distracted mm-hmm. because we want to try this, try that. You spread yourself out too thin. And oh, I've yeah. been I've been guilty of that several times. I've actually been retracting some of my businesses and getting out of them and selling out some of them, whatever, and, and trying to get just focused on Pilma Enamel because I got some other ventures, you know, and I'm messing with Mass Torch too. So it's, uh, but I really think, it takes a lot. There's like a hundred things you need to do to be successful, have a, build a successful law practice. But really it comes down to it all starts with you as the leader. And you've got to have grit, determination, and you've got to have focus, you know, and then you've got to, uh, you got to be a good leader. You know, you got yeah. to, I think I'm a good leader. I don't think I'm a yeah. good manager. Yeah. But a leader is a lot different than a manager, in my opinion. You know, no, I, I hear you on that. I'm thinking about the book as you, as you speak. I'm thinking about the book, Think and Grow Rich. You know, focus, clarity of thought, yeah. right? For anyone who hasn't read that, um, and if you have read it, read it again. That's a, that's that's like the OG book of mindset, success, um, thinking. So I think I think that's a really good book. So you know, and, and I feel like as an entrepreneur, you need to have an appetite for risk. Like I tend to lean, like I'll I'll take a gamble, like I'll I'll do something that maybe other people are. Shy, shy, reticent or unwilling to do. And I feel like you and I both let it ride. If it works, great. You know, if you have a, you just talk about business, uh, if, if something in your business is not working out, retract, you can just go somewhere else. But at least you tried that. A lot of people don't try. And it's like, you know, you just got to stay where you are. But you have to be, yeah. you know, I just hear your career arc. You kept leveling up and not being satisfied, right? And yeah. just being hungry and hungry. And so, I just, I want to ask you in the early nineties, you said you plateaued. Why? Why do you think, cause you had such growth in the eighties. What happened in the early nineties before you get to TV? Why do you think you plateaued at that point? Uh, well, I, I didn't know for a long time, but it was really uh, TV advertisers really started heavy in North Carolina mm-hmm. in the early eighties. I mean, well, I actually know what was it? Bates versus uh, Arizona was in 87, 88. I thought even earlier, but yeah. Probably. But anyway, yeah. The big guys didn't start doing big TV in, in North Carolina until about 82, 80, I mean, 92, 93. Okay. And, and yep. that's kind of what I figured. I figured that, you know, got to walk in at it. And I talked to this company, said, yeah, when well, they looked at the, what the history of like the last four or five years and the last two years of like quadruple what been spent on TV by PI lawyers. Uh, he said, that's where, that's where your cases are going. They're going mm-hmm. to these TV lawyers. You know, and he, you know, and that's what I kept telling about when I found that out. I said, I don't like it, but listen, you, you've yeah. got to pivot and change with the times. I mean, we learned that with COVID, right? Yeah. I mean, you cannot sit there. And I got so mad. I, I'd be sitting back in the courtroom waiting to try DWI cases, and some of the lawyers back there just moaning and groaning about the TV lawyers and, and how they're taking our cases. I said, well, they ain't our cases. Mm-hmm. I said, whoever cases gets them, I said, that you guys can keep. Moaning and groaning, I said, "But I'm gonna go do something about it," and I did. And then, then I became a TV lawyer, and then they hated my guts. <laughs> but I mean, you know, but I tried not to be a mule. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We really, we really worked on client service. That was a big part of our deal. We, we had a bill of rights. I had a eight hundred free eight hundred number to client advocate hotline. We had a thirty day satisfaction guarantee you can't get your file in time we had a lot of different things we did we paper people to death we called them every 30 days i mean we just did a lot of different things uh to build that and you know some of my other stuff that i teach you know with the newsletters and the client advisory group and the books and all this kind of stuff we really we were spending at our height about two million dollars a year on marketing and still 42 percent of our cases came from Oh, not, not lawyers or doctors, old clients. 42% yes. came from old See, clients. See, I'm with you on that. The tribe, the herd, because you could, you know, you could do TV. You could, you know, you, you, you have your people who know you, like you, and trust you. Like, that's what I've taken from you and really run with that. Customer service, you know, making them happy, raving fans, because they'll tell everyone how great Ken is, how great Chris is. Hopefully, you know, not everyone is you know, going to be a raving fan. If you do good work, you're going to grow. Now, if you're doing all this, you know, TV and then neglecting your bit, your clients are going to go somewhere else. 
Now, I'm interested. I, I'm hearing from you, like, the mid-90s. Was it 95 that you did Sorry TV? 96. 96. I know I know the story, but tell our listeners, how did that change the game for you when you went on oh, TV? Oh, well, I went from 20 cases to 120. I mean, listen, you can't do that now, okay? But, yeah. But the market was not as saturated as it is. Well, I mean, back then it wasn't. I had to turn it off because I couldn't handle the caseload. I, I had to come in and I, and I had to rearrange some things because I had to now I had to use some of that money I borrowed to hire people, yeah, you know, and stuff, and and, uh, and, and get people investigators to go out and sign these people up because back then there was no online signing up, and <laughs> you know we were and we were in twenty counties, so I mean we we had to go to them. I mean you know, yeah, it's uh, it's just changed so much, but you, you know you got to change with the times. I mean it wasn't any AI either, but see when I started. Uh, there was, we didn't have a copier in, in the office. We didn't have a computer in the office. We had a IBM selectors, and we used carbon paper yeah. to make copies for the court pleadings. I mean, that's just the way it was. It had white yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, then I was the first guy in the county to buy a word processor. I was the first law, <laughs> law firm in the county to buy computers and hook them up. You know, wow. and and my 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 phone now has got more power than my first computer had. Oh, I, easily, I, easily. I mean, it was like. Uh, 286k or so. I mean, it was like nothing. It was like, uh, yeah. I mean, watches got more power now. I mean, it's just crazy. But, but I was always, <laughs> I was always the guy out there trying to lead, trying to figure out how to be more efficient. Uh, very lucky that I hired some really good people that were a lot better than me at systems, processes, management, uh, yeah. and they yeah. kind of helped me. Uh, Cheryl Leon and Dave Faber. I couldn't have did it without them. Just to be honest with you. So I was, was the, the, I was the marketing genius, but I was not the, I was not the, not the infrastructure. Genius. Well, we talked about plan your strengths, delegate your weaknesses. That's the key. Yeah. I think you should just do a few, if you can do a few things right and then find rock stars, surround yourself with them, get out of their way, train them up. That's how you grow and scale. Yeah. Now was the TV thing, was it like literally like that month it just kicked up or was it a, a, a ramp up? It took right? a, it took about. 90 days to get to 120. That's fast. So what did you do about staffing, though? Because you must have been kind of freaking oh, out. I went nuts. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's that's six times. That's scary almost. It's almost like too much. Yeah, it know? was it was too much. We cut back some. I cut back my budget. I turned it off for two <laughs> months. Yeah, I mean, I did. I, I cut it back like 50%. I was spending 40. I went to 20. And, and, and then uh, I took that money I had to set aside, you know, to, to hire more help because. Yeah. It, know, it, was, it was scary. It was scary. I got scared. I wasn't lie about it. I got scared. Oh, I, I'm putting myself in that space. I would be freaking. I mean, that's like, that's stress. You know, you, you watch what you wish for kind of case, right? I mean, yeah. you just got the flood. You obviously, you know, you dug, you dug, and you hit pay dirt. And it was like, oh, this explosion of oil you found. Yeah. Um, see, it's so funny. Now it takes 12 to two, 12 months to 24 months to give traction on TV because everybody's on TV. Would you still do TV today if you were, uh, you know, if it was back where you were in the mid nineties, would you, would you still get on TV? If I had enough budget to stay yeah. with it and, and, and persevere because it, you're going to be, you're going to get very frustrated with it. And if I could be, if I had, I knew I could at least spend 10% of what, here's the goal. You got to take, look what's being spent every month. And if you can't at least spend 10% of that, don't do it. And then the other deal is I like to be in the top three or four. Mm -hmm. That's why I really like to be in the top three or four. But if I can't be in that, I got to at least have 10%. And then I got to sit there and know that I got to spend whatever that amount is for 18 months and probably going to be in the whole millions. And I got to be okay with that. And sleep at night and keep. Yeah. Spending. Yeah. If you're not okay with that, don't do it. It's not for the faint of heart. I, I, it was so much easier for me. In my time, you know, it's timing like everything. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there's so many other ways to do it now. And I think uh, online stuff, I think radio is a cheaper way to do it, to be honest with you, if done right. I think yeah. uh, I think if you do a combination of radio and billboards, you could be just as effective. But I think there's so many other ways to get cases online. I mean, you know, we talk about all these things. I mean, all these different referral systems you can set up. I mean, just yep. so many different ways. At my height, I had 32 different stra tactics as I was doing to get cases. I mean, and some of them cost me zilch, and some of them cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Mm -hmm. But the deal was I used them all, and I 
but I pushed them all just as if I was spending money on all of them. What I'm saying is I, I put the metal, the pedal to the metal on all yeah. of them and yeah. pushed it because, you know, what is Dan Kennedy says, you know, one's a terrible number. Well, I think this reliant. And back in my day, that's what most lawyers did. They just throw more money at it. And, they, and if they wanted more cases, they just up their budget. Can't quite do that now. I mean, that's not that's not enough. Yeah. Uh, but it made PI lawyers very lazy marketers, you know. And, and let's just be honest, it's such a lucrative field that you could actually be bad at at, at it and still make money. Just be honest. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, no you know, question. I mean, you can be terrible at marketing. Listen, my first commercials, I wouldn't even dare put them on today. They were terrible, but sure. it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I mean, it just didn't matter, you know, It's because uh, there wasn't was no competition. Yeah. I mean, I was yeah. spending 40000 I was number two guy in the market with a million people in the market, you know? Oh, man. You wow. Know? It's changed so much. You know, you mentioned Dan Kennedy, and I'm interested. So I learned about Dan Kennedy through Ben Glass, right, the Ben Glass world. I know you know Ben Glass. How did you – how did you – I th- it, tell me if I'm wrong. Did, were you influenced in, in some respect by Dan Kennedy? I thought you spent a day with him. Yeah. To, so yeah, he, I was in his know. mastermind. I was in his mastermind and I hired him for a whole day consult and, the, and I took my recorder and I sat there and recorded the whole day. But yeah, you know, so when 96, when I was trying to figure out how to do the marketing, I, I, mean, I figured out the TV, but there was other ways to do it. And there was you know, nobody out there sharing because the guys that were successful won't share. And uh, when it was, I didn't know anything about a mastermind, so I went to his stuff. I studied with I was in Jay Abraham's mastermind. I was in his mastermind. It's not cheap. I, yeah, I went. No, it was investment though. The way I looked at it, big time. If I could get there, listen, I would have figured it out anyway. But it just made me go so much faster, and that's what it's all about—speed, right? Yeah, and saving money. You know, people when the people talk to me, well, can this is kind of high for a mastermind? I said, well. If you look at it at expense, I guess it is, but I look at it as an investment and, you know, and, and that you're going to go so much faster. Even if you're smart enough to figure it all out yourself, you're going to find out what doesn't work, what does work so much faster that it's going to be worth the money that you're going to waste and lose in the time factor that it takes to get there. That it's, you're going to have a, it, the, the ROI is ridiculous. But, but I was going around these people, and then I, I did something else, too. This is in 96. I went down and spent three days with John Morgan. And just, just, just I said, can I go down and just shadow you for two or three days? And he, back then, he had about 20, 25 lawyers. I mean, he was not that big. I mean, he was still like the number one spender in Orlando, but he wasn't that big, okay? Mm-hmm. And uh, and he had a marketing company called PMP, which he sold a couple of years ago. Uh I found Practice out. made perfect. Yeah, and he sold that because of he's going national, and pissing there all his clients off. Which I mean, you know, you can't have it both. And he's smart to get rid of it. He he did the right thing. But uh, it, it, I, I mean, a lot. Of, I learned a lot from him in those three days. I mean, but I you just did. Read, yeah, I did. What, I mean, were some, you know, what were some big takeaways? You think if going back, one of the big takeaways was I, I was in a town with about ten thousand people done, and I was having a. Uh, he said, if you want to be a big time lawyer, you got to go to the big town. He said, what's the biggest city in your, your market? I said, Raleigh. He said, that's where your office needs to be, Ken. And that was a big jump for me because that was about an hour drive. And I put it off for about a year, but I would hire an associates and keep them. And they'd stay about a year, get trained, and they go off to Raleigh or Charlotte or Wilmington. They went because there was no social life in a, a town of 10,000. Sure. We, we, we were a dry county too, so there was no bars. <laughs> so I didn't, I couldn't keep anybody. And so once <laughs> I moved to Raleigh, and I and I got an office there, everybody mm-hmm. stayed. I mean, it was. Yeah. I mean, the only people that left are people I fired. Yeah, the lawyers and stuff. I mean, staff's a little different, but with lawyers, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it was. What uh, else did you take away from John Morgan? That's three days. That's a lot of time. Anything else? Uh, you- well, like one of the big things was. Uh, I asked him, I said, you know, you don't even own this office building. He said, well, I said, I ran it through an actuarial company, and I figured out if I took the same amount of money that I take to put put down and, and renovate a building, versus I put it in my marketing, mm. my return was like three times as much. Interesting. So so he said, you know, he said, I ain't saying I never want. And so when I went to Raleigh, I just leased buildings. I mean, 
when I sold out, my partner, he bought a building, but I just always leased them because we kept growing. That's yeah. another thing, too. You build a building, you know, then you're kind of stuck, right? Yeah. And we, we bought some satellite offices that we knew we were never going to have a big office there, like little, like little, you know, 1,200, 1,500 feet office space. And we put people in there to just work the desk, you know, like in Fedville and uh, Durham, some of the bigger cities, but yet not as big as Raleigh. And I kept my hometown office just because I owned that office to start with, and that's where I came from. And I, it was out of probably not business sense, but just a, a loyalty to the town. I don't know. But, yeah, that, I guess that was probably one of the big deals. And and then he, was talk, he taught me about, you know, he said, you really need to understand posting and on this TV stuff and, and not let them take advantage of you. He said, well, you really need to hire my company and da, 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 we can do it for you. And I didn't yeah. hire his company. I didn't. Yeah. I, uh, I was just, because he told me his plans was, you know, he's, he's fulfilling his plans back from 1996. He's going, wow. he's on he's in the market. Very wow. smart guy. Very smart no, guy. No, no question. He was my first guest on this podcast. He uh, had Very smart guy. Out. Yeah, he was very generous. He's been, and my interactions with lunch and on this podcast, very generous to me. And I appreciate that. He's got a great story. He was a paper boy. You yeah. know, and just like he, he didn't grow up, he didn't grow up wealthy. He didn't grow up with a whole lot. But he had, no. a, he, 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 he was, you know, he was given uh, enough God given ability to just see things in a certain clarity, right? A certain way to, that, um, that is unique. And uh, yeah. he just went for it. I think it's fantastic. Um, but so, so we're talking about Jay Abraham, you know, Dan Kennedy, uh, John Morgan. These, so you, I wonder if you could ask me, if you're comfortable sharing how much money you've spent your own professional development, because this stuff isn't cheap, right? We're talking about, you know, professional development. That's how you move the needle. That's how you get ahead. I feel in business. Probably since 82. Yeah. Ball since 80, just all in. If, if you were to estimate. Somewhere between 600 and 800,000. But I bet maybe, heard- maybe, maybe a million. I don't know. Cause it's, you always sure. probably close to, to probably closer to a million than eight. But your return oh. on that, I'm sure, has been oh, yeah. more than worth it, right? So that's what we're talking about. You got to spend some money sometimes, right? I, I encourage yeah. the listener. You know, we'll talk about the you know the mastermind experience. Talk about coaching. Yeah, you can't do this alone. You can't do big things just hanging out in front of your computer all day. Like you got to get out. You got to meet other yeah. lawyers and, and yeah. network. I mean, you know, I mentor a lot of people, but I still got mentors. I so are you a mastermind couple. yourself now or no? I am. Or- I mean, I'm in. I'm in uh, one. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's entrepreneurs that have their own info business like I do, but it's, some of them are doing dentists, some of them are doing artists, some of them oh, are doing nice. musicians. Nice. Uh, you know, uh, musician schools, what do you call them? The, where they teach you how to play instruments. Sure, sure. Music schools. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we meet two or three times a year and share what's working and not working. Um, that's really the only one I'm in right now. But you're always but doing I'm something. Good. You're always but, doing yeah, something. But I'm, but I'm, yeah, and I like I'm doing some stuff now with uh, Cardone. Oh yeah, uh, and I'm doing some stuff with uh, Russell Brunson on success. He's he's bought all all this stuff from uh, Napoleon Hill, and he's got this whole deal now for like ninety seven dollars a month, and, and it's about success stories and success and mindset and different things like that and mastermind. So I just did it out of curiosity, really. Sure, but uh, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, I mean, it, but I, but I do, you know, I run five masterminds now a year. We meet three times, so I have fifteen mastermind meets a year, plus mine, so it's eighteen. So I, I'm in eighteen mastermind meets a year, so that's a lot. <laughs> so I want to talk about Pilma, but there was a beginning to Pilma. So I think you said in in 2009 Pilma started, but your wife earlier than that was like, "Hey, you got to charge money for this." Did it feel weird to? Because you obviously had accumulated knowledge about the industry, right? Did, was it weird at first to ask to be paid for that knowledge, or did it just yeah, come very easy? Yeah, okay. yeah, it was. And then, and then the other problem is, I've always had this problem. Of course, some people will disagree with me, uh, but uh, Abraham told me a long time ago. He said, "You, you, you do not charge enough for for your knowledge base." And he said, "You, you, it's like you don't believe in yourself enough." Yeah, he said. Uh, so he he been asking me that for years. I mean, for I mean, I have his cell phone. I mean, I can I can dial him anytime I want to. I never try to bother him, but every, sometimes he'll call me about something and you know not ask me 
advice, but just to check on something or you know, if I know somebody or, you know, check and he in. always asks me, he says, have you gone up on your prices yet? Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. You know, but I've always, and then, and then I watch some guy, my competitors that are charging ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month for masterminds. And, you know, I'm not even close to that. And I, I don't think I ever could charge that much because I don't think I could give that much value. I mean, I can and I can't. What I'm saying is I don't think people believe it. <laughs> and I'm just not a Tony Robinesque enough to do it, get, get, get away with it. You know, and that's okay. I mean, you know, I'm actually, I'm going up on my prices this year um, for the first time in four years. I tell people I, I, I'm not doing this. The number one reason for doing this was not money. I like money. Because money gives you freedom to do what you want to do with who you want to do it. But I don't love money. Okay. I used to love money when I first got out of law school. I, hear I don't you. love it. I don't love I it anymore. Hear you. But, I, but I respect it and I like it. And it gives me the freedom to do what I want to do. And so this is more to me of a lifestyle business. Yeah. And I really want to help people. Uh, it gives, it makes me feel good inside. It gives me purpose. Uh, it makes me feel like I'm still worth something that I can help that I'm making some little difference in the world. Uh, and of course the money's okay. It's fine. I like it, but it never was the number one reason I, I started Pilma. You know, then when I first started my first law firm, that was, it was to get money. I ain't gonna lie about it. That yeah. changed. Yeah. Uh, what I've learned is if you really give really good value and give really good service, you can make all the money you want. I promise I'd you. Kill it. It's, you know, it's I'm serious. I'm serious. You'll make all the money you, all the money you ever need. But you've got to be authentic and sincere, and you got to have a passion for what you're doing. I've told all my children, and I would tell all you, tell all your children, find something you got a passion for, and we, we can figure out how to make money. Oh yeah. Because that's <laughs> what happened to me practicing law. I got it one morning. I didn't have any more passion for it. But just sit there and do it because I was making good money. I was making a lot more money back then than I am even now. now. Yeah, but 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 why be miserable? I've seen a lot of miserable rich people. I don't want to be miserable and rich. I'd rather be uh, very uh, comfortable and happy. <laughs> I mean, I never go wanting for. I get everything I need and ninety percent of what I want. But I don't want like a seven thirty seven plane. I don't want a hundred foot yacht. I don't want that stuff. Um, you know, I don't need a Maserati. I don't need. I, I don't mind like my, I'm older, and as you get older, that stuff is not as important as when you're younger. Sure. Uh, sure. And I tend, and you're talking about taking risk. Mm -hmm. When I was your age, I never worried about risk because I knew I knew how to make money, and I knew I was young enough I could make it back. Yep. When you get in your 60s, it's a little different. You oh, say, yeah. I, I know how to make money, but I don't know that I got enough time left to make it back if I lose. Ten million dollars, right? More sober on the risk, right? A little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, you, you, yeah, yeah. You you have to you have to really take more calculated risk. I still take risk. I invest in mass storage. That's a risk because all that could go, that could all go to hell. I no, hear you. No, you know. So I do take risks, but but not as much as I used to. When I was in my thirties and forties, I, I put it all on the line. I mean, I did. I went. I mean, I tried so many things that didn't work in marketing. Sure. But the things that did work, my God, we were way ahead of the pack. We killed it for at least a year or two until everybody figured it out. And, then we, were on, and then we were on something else. You know? I love Gotta it. Take two I steps ahead of them. No, you have to. I, and I love that. So I can ask you this question. So you, you know, I'm just going to be upfront. You grew up poor, right? Yeah. Now yeah. you have Pilma. You have really smart, really successful personal injury lawyers paying really good money for your knowledge. Right. Considering, you know, your backstory, your story today, how does that make you feel? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I feel honored, feel grateful, feel humbled. You know, I mean, yeah. But people that really know me know that I'm a pretty humble guy. I'm not really a, I, I got an ego like everybody else, but it's not as like most PI lawyers. You know, a lot of most PI lawyers have to have a really big ego to be successful. I don't think you have to be, but I, I see that as a trait, and, you know, and there's still some that don't, uh, but I've never had a big ego. I, I, when I say ego, I got an ego. I've never been a braggart. Does that make sense? Sure. No, it's and not. That was, hard. that was hard. That was something Jay Abraham had to jump on me about too. He said, listen, 
You know, he was the one that came up with the meal air maker for me. I was embarrassed with that, that, that deal. And he says, you've got to anoint yourself. He says, do you not believe you really can help? I said, I know I have, I've got proof. He says, well then tell people. He said, don't be afraid of it. Don't be embarrassed by it. He said, you, he said, you, it's like you don't have confidence in yourself. I said, it's not that. I said, I just feel like I'm being a show off or bragging. And I just don't like that. I don't like people that do that. Sure. I mean, I, I said, my actions don't speak loud. He said, it doesn't. He said, you've got, he said, I'm telling you, kid. I mean, that's my biggest struggle in life has been uh, really pushing it out there that I'm, 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 I'm great and all this kind of stuff because it's very, it's almost embarrassing. I, I think, yeah, no, man, it makes a hundred percent sense. I think we're both super humble and that's, I think where we connect is that we know our stuff. Um, and we, we, we didn't grow up, you know, nothing came super easy. So uh, no, silver spoons, no, silver spoons no. And, and that, and that just sort of like my, like, it just sort of sobers you and it just sort of like humbles you because like you said, there's so much arrogance in the PI space, right? There's, there's flash and, 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 and glitz. But I mean, you know, if, when I, whenever I speak, Ken, whenever I speak to like a bar organization, like they, I'm, I'm speaking to a bar organization again on Tuesday, Massachusetts, right? The fact that lawyers are going to listen to me talk about stuff that they, that I know they want to know about. It's like, God damn, like I, I never, as a kid, no one would have thought I would have done much to be honest with you. And yeah. I just feel like that you and I, it's like, made something of ourselves, took risks, used our tools, didn't, didn't squander anything, took full advantage. So the listeners on this call, on the, on the podcast, right. Take advantage of all you have. And you have one ride on this bus, right. You got to either yeah. kill it, you know, crush it or, or, or take a seat, but you got to make a decision. Like, are you, are you all in or, or, or you got to figure out what's your purpose in life. I really believe that. I think everybody needs a purpose. I think that's why when I retired, I just didn't have any purpose left. I think that's what a lot of people die quickly after they retire. 100%. Because you got no purpose. When you get up in the morning, there's no real purpose. I think you need purpose. I mean, I think God puts you on this earth for something. Or, or if you don't believe in God, what it ha- whoever put you here, yeah. put you here for a reason. And, and I think it's, you know, uh, I think I helped a lot of lawyers. I've made enough money that I've helped a lot of uh, charities, which I do not disclose because I don't, I got one that I do because I'm, because uh, I don't just put my money in, I raise money. Uh, it's called Lawyers Against Drug Addiction. And the reason I started that is because I lost a son about five Sorry. years ago. I actually did it last month, five years ago, to uh, a heroin overdose with the, yeah. uh, what's, what's that stuff they put in it? Now they lace it with, uh, he, he had some of that stuff that comes from China. Oh, I can't geez. remember the name of it now. But it's, uh, but, but anyway, he, he died of an overdose. Uh, but he'd been battling drugs his whole life. And, uh, you know, I always try to pull something good out of something bad. And yeah. So, yeah. You know, I never try to look at it like, why? You know, I think it was, there was a reason for that. You know, he was going through hell too. He had, he, he tried so hard to stay clean. I mean, it, he really was. He had been clean for a year. That's why he died, really. And then got hold of something that was just too strong for him. I'm uh, sorry. That's terrible. Yeah, well, that's, that's you know, well, there's one thing starting in life, it's death, but you never expect to see your kid die before you die. No. And that, you know, I lost my father, I lost my mother, I lost my brother. None of it's 10% of how much, I mean, his death was like this, the worst thing in the world. I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. That was probably the worst thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I know it is, you know. And, uh, but I still didn't just, you know, give up. I said, there's a reason for it. I don't know the reason, but I'm going to see if I can do something a little bit. So now we raise money. We raised like a hundred thousand last year. Wow. We're, we're trying to raise some money this year. I'm getting ready to do something new that you can be the first one to tell about it. I'm going to do this challenge. I'm going to lose 50 pounds or more by the summit. And I'm going to get people you, to pledge. I'll get people to pledge money. And, I, and I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'll be raising some money for my, my charity. And that, that, every bit of that goes to some organization. Like we give it to some uh, 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 nonprofit rehab centers. Uh, but I even pay, I, I pay everything out of my pocket. So there's no expenses in that charity. I paid even the transaction fees for the merchant cards. So everything that's, when I tell somebody, if you put a dollar in this, it's going fully. 
there's not a dime that goes to me or anybody else for admin costs. I pay all the admin costs out of my pocket. Plus, I throw a lot of money in there with it. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to do that because I feel like that, that'll hold me accountable because I'm not going to mm-hmm. let uh, my charity down. And it also would be uh, it's accountability because I'm I've sat there and pushed it out there. I wrote it down and I showed it to the world. It's out and there. If I don't do it, I'm off. I got too much grit not to do it. <laughs> so we're going to see. My wife says, I could never do that. I said, it's the only way I will do it. I said, you're, you're, you're going to have six pack abs by the time of the summit. I don't know about that. <laughs> I won't go that far now, but I'm going to lose 50 pounds. You'll be ripped. But, yeah, my doctor told me I need to, too. My blood pressure was a little up last week. Okay. My physical. So, yeah. I want to stick around. I got. Look, I still got some more work to do. Well, I just feel like if you retired, you'd go crazy, man. If I'm being honest, I just feel like yeah, yeah. You know. I'll never retire. I might. No, down. I know. I know. I'll slow down. I want to slow down, but I don't want to retire. So yeah. you're gonna. So you go to a lot of conferences because obviously you know you're on the trail and you're interacting. You're connecting with lawyers, networking, growing Pelma, right? And I've been. I think I've been a member for I want to say three years. You know, in the mastermind. I'll be I'll be re-upping this this coming year. I've gotten a lot of um, serious growth in the last few years, and I attribute that to Pilma. So I'd encourage everyone, you know, check out Pilma. It's been a very strong organization for me professionally. And if, anyone who knows me knows I don't mess around. Ken knows I don't mess around. So I wouldn't be messing around with Pilma if it wasn't legit, you know. And that's no. And, that's and I think the people that are the doers, the only people that it doesn't work for, are people that just talk about it and don't do it. But if you if you implement. I'd say twenty five percent of what you learned at these masterminds, you're going to grow. You can't help but grow. Hundred percent. I, I wish I could say it was all my brilliance, but it's really all these lawyers working together. Yeah. You know, and it, and just I, I facilitate them and I put them together and I try to put people with, with the same issues and different things and some that's got strengths in other places and. But yeah, no, it's it's. Uh, I just think it's a game changer. I think masterminds. I, I, that's why I bid in one. The last 25 years, or either doing one or, or being in one, I just really believe in them. I wrote a book yeah. on it, The Mastermind Effect. How, how can people get that book if they want to get their hands on it? Uh, I think you can go to I think you can go to Amazon, and I think it, uh, we just got it. I think it's going to be Audible. I think I think they're going to download it in Audible by the end of the month. So hopefully, it'll be where you can just listen to it. When's the? I, uh, I actually when's... read it. I actually read the book. I hated it, but I did it. <laughs> When uh, is the is the Pelma Summit uh, next year? It's May the fourteenth through the sixteenth, and it's going to be in New Orleans at the. Uh, it's, not, it's not the Ritz; it's the uh, Roosevelt. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah. Uh, and, I encourage uh, you know I go to that summit. I'm going to bring my marketing assistant to, with me. It's my first business conference. Bring in someone from my office. I'm excited about that. Yeah. It's a really good conference. There are heavy hitters that go to this conference. And and I mean I got I got to be honest with you. And ask you like I'm just going back. I'm just thinking about your dad, like how he and your mom, right? How they would feel like you're you got this conference. You know all these lawyers coming across the country. Um, I mean your dad. You know I just feel like even though he didn't give you a whole lot of attaboys, he's got to be looking down and saying. My son's oh, yeah. pretty good. I'm I sure. Mean, I'm sure. You know, and that's gonna make yeah. you feel really. I know my my dad feels that way. My dad isn't here for under you know left under bad circumstances. I know he's proud. You know, and that's that's meaningful stuff. It makes you feel yeah. good. Yeah, you want to you want to impress. Most people want to impress their parents. Hundred I mean, you know. percent. Yeah, and we're gonna have something special. The last day of the conference, we're actually having a breakout session for staff members. They go in there and do workshops on how to use AI for marketing. Oh wow, like that's to, cool, man! For videos and different things like and it. the content. I like so, that. So you know, we're going to do that too. So, so we're going to have something a little different. People, make sure you sign up for that conference. Space is limited. You want to get in there. It's a really good room. Awesome speakers. So I think another good conference is Miami NTL, and you are very kind to allow me to have a stage there. We were talking yeah. about grassroots marketing because you and I are both really serious grassroots marketers. That's a good conference too. Miami NTL I would encourage people. Ken, obviously you'll be there. I'll be there. That's a that's a great conference. If you're a criminal lawyer, right? There's a track for you. If you're a trial lawyer, if you're just running a you're CEO, running a business yeah. as a lawyer, that's a powerhouse conference, I think. What do you think, Ken? Yeah, it is. There'll be over a thousand lawyers there, and uh, they've been very kind and generous to me over the years to. Uh, Give me half of the first day to do a breakout session just for marketing and management. They call it the Pilma morning. And so awesome. I can bring, I can, I can speak and bring in whoever I want to speak. And I've actually brought you and uh, Tanner Jones 
and that it's going to be us three, and we're going to be speaking that morning. Uh, I was just on morning. Tanner's podcast like six months ago. Super yeah. smart dude. So yeah, I'm, I'm honored. I'm grateful to be part of it. I'm going to bring my A game, you know, and I'm just, I'm excited for oh, that. Oh, you big will. Time. Yeah, big time. Appreciate it. So, so um, I want to ask you about, uh, you know, kind of wrapping up. What do you think your greatest success in life is so far? <sighs> ah, that's a good one. Probably raising my children. I hear you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, you know, and, and listen, I raised them all the same and, one was a drug addict, and, and then I have, got one that's a nurse, and I got one that works just a regular job because he's got learning disabilities. But okay. but the deal is uh, they were all good kids. They all had good hearts, and uh, they always had really great, great manners in front of other people. They were always, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. That's what you so want. I feel like me and, their, me and my ex-wife did a good job of, raise, uh, of instilling some manners in them, you know, and, and, and values and stuff like that. I guess that's my biggest success story. Uh, that's what know. it's all about. That's my biggest you success. Know. It's not yeah. even, you know, close. You know, I think most people would say, oh, building two law firms and selling them for millions or doing this, growing this. Nah, I mean, that, that's fun. And it's, it's, it's exciting, but it ain't my biggest success. I mean, you know, and I think, uh, I think also, too, that finally figuring out what it takes, because I mean, I was I mean, I'm on my second marriage, finally figuring out what it takes to make a successful marriage, because I was lost the first time. It's hard. Um, it's hard. We both were, and uh, I it's really feel I'm the happiest I've ever been. You know, Good for you, know, man. That's awesome. You know, and uh, she gets me, I get her. We respect each other. We were friends before we were lovers. I just think it makes a big difference. All you know what I'm saying? I do and, know and we, can, we can agree to disagree, you know. Yeah. It. Just, it's just, uh, yeah, that's probably my two big successes back. So. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that big time. What book has had the most profound impact on you in your life? Yeah, probably uh, Michael Gerber's. So either that one, it's between that one and Think and Grow Rich. Mm. You know, yeah. e and Think and Grow Rich, probably the two the two most influential as far as got me thinking. Okay. hundred percent. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I might read better books with better content, but I'm talking about had the biggest impact on me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think, yeah. you know, I think there's some other books out there that are better as far as actually teaching stuff. But those things were very thought provoking to me and changed the way I looked at things. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, uh, especially the Napoleon Hill stuff. Yeah. I'd say it's probably timeless. the most. It's time. Yeah, like you said at the beginning, if you ain't read it, you need to read it. I, I read it at least once a year, sometimes twice. A year. Oh, is that right? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, good. It's like a, that and It's a Wonderful Life is two things I have to do every year. I have to watch the movie <laughs> It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart at Christmas time, and I have to read uh, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Yeah, by the Christmas tree. Nice. I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Very yeah. good. Ken, I, I really appreciate it. How can get, people get in touch with you? How can they get in touch with Pilma? How can they um, learn more about yeah, you? It's uh, info at pilma.org. That's P-I-L-M-M-A dot O-R-G. Fantastic. Ken, that was an incredible conversation. That's why I reached out to you because I love talking with you. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. I know well, this is really you, good for the listeners. So thank you, buddy. Appreciate yeah. you, man. So that's it for this episode of The Early Show. Be sure to check out more episodes of our show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and the Answering Legal YouTube channel.